Well, thank you all so much for joining us for the Nature of Fall with the Mass Audubon. Autumn in Massachusetts is filled with seasonal wonders and mysteries unique to our state. Why do leaves change color and fall off their trees? What animals are rustling through those crunchy fallen leaves and what exactly are they doing? Why don't we hear birds, crickets, and bees anymore? This online program will introduce the seasonal dynamics of the nature of Massachusetts in the fall, including the plants and animals that experience it. You'll also leave with ideas and suggestions for observing, appreciating, and supporting nature near your home. And this presentation is led by pa uh, Patty Steinem, who's the Education Coordinator for Mass Audubon's Connecticut River Valley Sanctuaries, which is based out of Arcadia in East Hampton and North Hampton. Uh, she has worked at Mass Audubon for 30 years, developing and overseeing programs for adults, families, and children. Uh, she currently oversees Arcadia's Outdoor Nature Preschool. And as you might imagine, fall is Patty's favorite season. So again, want to thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library, along with the libraries in Andover and Danvers, for helping make uh, this morning's program possible. And all uh, 80 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Patty for joining us here this morning. And Patty, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And thank you everybody for coming today. What a beautiful fall day. And so good to see people from not only all over Massachusetts, but sounded like uh, North Carolina, Oregon, all over the country. So thank you all for coming. And as Robert said, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will certainly try to get to all of them. So what we're gonna do today is talk a little bit about the science of fall, why things do as they do. We'll talk a little bit about the tr plant transitions, what happens pretty much to the trees, We'll talk a little bit about the animals or some of the wildlife focusing on mammals. And then we'll just talk a little bit about how to enjoy fall responsibly. So tomorrow, September 22nd, is the fall equinox. So this was a, a great day to do this program. So during the equinox, sunrise and sunset are roughly 12 hours apart worldwide. And the Earth's tilt is perpendicular to the angle of the sun. So as we know, the temperature begins to drop. So the average temperature in mid-October in the Boston area is down to the upper 50s or so. And the temperature at night drops as well. So because of that, because of the angle of the Earth's axis in relationship to the sun, all of that, that changes our season into the fall season. So this picture was taken by a colleague and friend in Plymouth, Mass. He lives right on a cranberry bog. So I love his picture right over here. So during the equinox, just around the time of the equinox, the full moon is called the harvest moon. And I don't know if anybody saw that last week, but it was absolutely beautiful. It was like a red moon around here. And the harv it's named the harvest moon because it has to do with farming. So around this time of year, around the equinox, the sunset is for several hours is basically later for several hours around the equinox. Usually the moon rises about an hour later each night, but around the equinox, it rises just about 20 or 30 minutes later each night, enabling the farmers to be able to get in all that extra time to get their crops in, especially before the frost. So that's how we get the harvest moon. And there it is rising. So here's a little bit about October, baptize me with leaves, swaddle me in corduroy, and nurse me with split pea soup. October, 
tuck tiny candy bars in my pockets and carve my smile into a thousand pumpkins. Oh, autumn, oh, tea kettle, oh, grace. I love this little poem by Rainbow Rowell. So this is the time when we start thinking of and looking at the foliage. If I were to ask folks what, they, what reminds them of fall, probably many people would say the colors, which are certainly spectacular. And we're going to just take a little look at what happens to the foliage over here. So we have a green leaf over here. Most of the year, from spring until fall, most of the leaves are green and they're masked with chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is the pigment which is most visible in leaves. Chlorophyll does require sunlight and warmth in order to be produced. So once the cold weather comes, the chlorophyll stops production and then we begin to see the green in the leaves beginning to deteriorate. So in addition to the green pigment, underneath the green, what we don't see, but it's there, are other pigments. And these are usually yellow and orange. So these are called the carotenoids. This is the same pigment which is in things that we're very familiar with, such as, or, uh, such as actually oranges, and carrots. So they're there during the growing season, but they're just masked by the chlorophyll. So once the temperature begins to drop, there's not enough sunlight during the day, the chlorophyll is, is no longer being produced, you begin to see less green, and you begin to see some of those yellow and orange colors. And then you begin to see some of those other little chemical or those pigments over there. So there's our chlorophyll. There's our oranges and yellows. So those are the xanthophylls and the carotenoids. And then another chemical reaction happens. And these are the reds that we begin to see. So these are called the, whoops, the anthrocyanins, ignore that it's brown over there. These were the anthrocyanins, and these are newly produced at this time of year. So it's another pigment. So, uh, and then we have the browns over there. Those are actually tannins. So actually browns can be some of the anthrocyanins as well, but a lot of the browns are also produced by tannins. And we often see that in the oak trees. So just taking another look at this, so the carotenoids are the yellows and the oranges and a little bit of browns for there. The xanthophylls are actually in the same family as the carotenoids, and those are usually the yellows. So those are the ones that have been here year round, just masked by the chlorophyll. The anthrocyanins, those are the reds. So those are the ones that are newly produced in response to the light and the plant chemistry, as well as the reduction in temperature and the water. And then the chlorophyll is what was here all along, and that's the green. And that's what, um, since it's the temperature is dropping and the sunlight isn't uh, there as much as during the growing season, the chlorophyll is no, no longer produced. And then we also see the browns and that bronze color, and we often see those in the oak trees. So here's just a little picture which shows some of the different colors that you can see in some of the different trees over here. So the red maple has that beautiful red color, the cherries, you may have in your yard or maybe in a place where you go walking where you see the bronze and the gold and the red. The hickories have that beautiful bronze color. The sassafras, gorgeous yellow. Sumacs have that the, the red, which are out there right now. So the different trees certainly have different coloring of their leaves. And it's all because of their, their different chemical makeup and the different pigments that they have. 
So there's a sequence to the fall colors that you've probably noticed. So the first one to usually change colors are the red maples. So right now, if you're driving along the highway or perhaps you have a red maple in your yard, you can see that bright orange red color of the red maple. Another one that, that actually I didn't put in here, but if you ever see a sweet gum tree, that turns just about the same time as the red maple. That's often found in wetlands, not a common tree in Massachusetts, but one of the first ones also to be changing color so that we see that foliage. White ash um, is an early one. We can see the maroon, the rust, the green, the red. And as I mentioned a minute ago, the staghorn sumac, that beautiful red and orange. That's often planted around highways. So if you're driving up and down 95 or 128, uh, wherever you're going, look for the red of that staghorn, staghorn sumac. Staghorn sumac is not poison sumac, so not one to worry about. In fact, you can actually take berries of the staghorn sumac, boil them up, and you can make a tea or a lemonade out of them. By October, we begin to see more of the yellows. We have several species of hickory in New England. So we begin to see the yellows of the hickory. The black birch has that beautiful yellow as does the beech. And the beech is kind of like a yellow to brown. Sugar maple, definitely one of my favorites, but that bright orange and yellow. If those of you who come to the program next week might learn that sugar maple is one of the trees that is, is unfortunately having a hard time with climate change. So some of the trees are migrating north, some of the species. So in our area in Massachusetts, we'll probably be seeing more hickories, which were more of a Southern species coming to our area. Uh, but many of the sugar maples will be moving more into Northern New England. Uh, we begin to see the aspens in October with that beautiful yellow as well. And then this, the foliage season continues right until November. And this is the time when the oaks really begin to shine. So the red oak has that reddish brown color, the black oak kind of a yellow brown, the white oak, the brown. Again, a lot of these are the tannins. And the cherry is a late one, and you can see some of the yellows. So the question that we always ask is, what will the fall foliage season be like? And it's a really hard question to answer. There's so many factors which are involved. So we certainly had a drought this summer in New England, and it's often thought that if there's a drought, then the foliage will be early for some of the trees and delayed for others. So again, because of there's, there's so many different types of trees, there's so many different factors affecting it, it's really, really hard to say. An early frost will weaken those anthrocyanins. Those are the ones that are newly produced. So that's what it, it's, it's thought to be. The bottom line is temperature and moisture during and prior to the reduction of photosynthesis will determine what's going on with the foliage. Uh, so during our growing season uh, in the summertime, that's when we, we certainly have seen a drought here in Southern New England. But again, um, many, many, many factors that come into play. Um, again, bottom line over here is if you have warm, sunny, cool, crisp, day, warm, sunny days, cool, crisp nights above freezing, then that often leads to brilliant colors. So, and, and in my mind, no matter how brilliant the foliage season is, 
it's still beautiful. We have so many different species of trees. There's so many pigments out there that even if it's not one of the best seasons, it's still a beautiful season. And certainly lots of people travel to New England to see our beauty, our beautiful foliage over here. So we're looking over here at deciduous trees. So this is the same picture taken in the fall and taken in the winter. So what's happening to the deciduous trees, I should say to most of the deciduous trees, is that when the temperature drops, when the air, when it's cooler and there's less sunlight, a message is sent to each of the leaves, which produces a some cells which are called abscission cells. So the abscission, same root as scissors, means to cut off. So what this is doing is it's sending out a layer which is gonna cut the leaf off from where the stem of the leaf hit the trunk or the branch of the tree. And what it's cutting the leaf off so that the leaf will die and fall off. And where it falls off, it basically, the tree seals itself up so that moisture and cannot get inside and do damage. So that's the big reason for the deciduous trees to lose their leaves. They don't want water damage. They don't want the nutrients to get out. They don't want the water which is inside there to get out. The trees are dormant, so certainly not dead, um, still alive. And if the cold got in there, then that would do a lot of damage. So that abscission layer knocks off those trees, they fall to the ground, and then we see a picture to the right over here. So our deciduous trees without leaves. There are a few trees in our area that hold their leaves throughout the season. And Robert, I'm gonna ask if folks can put in the chat if they have seen trees, deciduous trees in the middle of the winter here in New England that maintain their leaves. Their, the leaves are dead. They're kind of a bronze color, hint, hint, um, but they stay on the trees until the winter, maybe like winds will knock them off, maybe heavy snow will knock them off, or maybe they stay on until the new leaves of the spring will knock them off. So just let me know if there's any answers. Uh, yes, uh, so we have lots of uh, folks saying oak trees. Um, we also have someone saying Japanese maple, perhaps. Uh, someone saying uh, beech uh, trees. And then um, one, let's see, how am I pronouncing this? R rhododendron, um, rhododendron. So it looks okay. like oak, Japanese maple, beech, and rhododendron are the, are the guesses. Okay, well, very good answers. So the oak and the beech are the two that mainly do keep their leaves. I'll get to the other two in just a second. So they do not have that abscission layer. And it's thought not, not determined for, not 100% um, just uh, known for sure, but it's thought that these were original Southern species so it wasn't important for them to lose their leaves and to, to seal off. A lot of the trees in the South, it doesn't happen. They don't lose their leaves. And again, losing the leaves is so that the cold doesn't get in and do any damage. So very good for the people with the oak and the beech and excellent also. The rhododendron does keep its leaves. The rhododendron is not deciduous though, so it's an evergreen. So the evergreen trees, like the pines, the rhododendron, the spruce, uh, the hemlocks, the, most of those, not the rhododendron, but most of the others that I just mentioned, we know their leaves as called needles. Needles actually are a type of a leaf. And in the next slide, we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but so the rhododendron definitely keeps their leaves. And in fact, a really, really cool thing 
that you can do with the rhododendron in the winter time is to look out your window, see a rhododendron, and get an idea of what the temperature is. So when it's really, really cold, the rhododendron will fold its leaves in to try to maintain heat inside. And so that the, the leaf is not losing moisture, not losing heat, and therefore the plant is not losing moisture and heat. So if it's really curled in, you know it's below zero. If it's flat, then it wants to open itself up so that the sunlight can come in and it's warmer. So rhododendron is just like a thermometer tree or shrub. And then I think somebody mentioned Japanese maple. So that's not a native around here. So I can't say for sure about losing its leaves. Um, whoever has that in their yard or who has seen it probably knows more about that than I do. But my guess is because it's not native, it probably very much like the oaks and the beaches is from a warmer climate. So therefore does not need to lose their leaves. So you can drive down the highway, you can impress your friends and you can just point out a tree. Most likely in our area, you're gonna see oaks and beaches and you can say that is an oak or a beach in the winter time. So now looking at the evergreens over here. So this is a white pine. The white pine trees are were um, one of our pretty infamous trees when the colonists came over here from England. They looked at the, the tall, straight white pine trees and they marked some of them to be, treat, to be used on the masts of ships. So these were considered to be some of the king's trees, the beautiful white pines. The white pines also, I mentioned about sumac making a tea. You can boil the leaves of the white pine and you can um, make a really good tea that they say has more vitamins than a glass of orange juice. I'm not sure it tastes as good as orange juice, but I guess that's, that's just my opinion. Uh, but the white pines over here um, are a demonst or demonstrate our evergreen trees. And as I mentioned, they lose their needles, needles again being leaves. They lose them, but they don't lose them all at one time, like we do with the deciduous trees. So they are one step ahead in the spring when it comes to photosynthesizing. They already have some leaves. So that's kind of like ahead of the game of the deciduous trees. They um, also have several adaptations. So having long, thin needles reduces the loss of water. So tree leaves, be it needles or broad leaves, like an oak or a maple, have something called stomata on them. You can see this in some of the leaves. If you turn over a huckleberry, or a, um, a blueberry. And those are two that I can think of that on the underside of the leaf, they have these little dots. Those are called stomata. You can't see them on all of them. A few of them though you can. The stomata is for air and water exchange. So again, if they have large stomata or very obvious, then it can lead to water loss and nutrient loss or water getting in and doing damage. But by having a long thin needle, that's one adaptation to prevent it, less surface area, less chance of losing that water. They are also very waxy, the leaves of the needles, and that repels the water. So another adaptation. And then finally, the needles being long and thin and not broad wing help to lessen heavy snow damage. So if there's heavy snow on the trees, often it will fall off and often just the shape of the needles will help to prevent it from doing an awful lot of damage. Some of you may have seen or tree, um, deciduous trees, like oak trees or maple trees, if there's an early snow snowstorm 
and having those big broad leaves will often do an awful lot of damage. Often that's when there's a lot of branches that come down. So we're just gonna take a few look, uh, if, look at a few pictures of some foliage and some autumn colors. This is actually my favorite habitat. This is a quaking bog and there's several throughout New England, but the fall colors, the maroons, some of those uh, red maroon colors are so evident in the bog. As is on the picture to the right, this is what's called cotton grass, which is not a real grass, it's a sedge, but um, beautiful in the fall foliage. This is, we're gonna go through a few Mass Audubon sanctuaries here. So this is uh, one of my favorite places to go enjoy the fall foliage. This is a sanctuary called High Ledges. So you can see in the picture, it's in the Northwestern part of the state. So this is along the Mohawk Trail, which is known for its beautiful foliage. And High Ledges is in the town of Shelburne. If you ever wanna take a ride out this way, a, a gorgeous place to see the foliage. Or if you wanna go down to Martha's Vineyard, you can go down to um, the, I'm sorry, I can't see the name. I know I put this down here um, and the name is just escaping me, but the sanctuary on Martha's Vineyard where you can see some of the seagrass and the beautiful kind of yellows and browns over there. And then Tidmarsh Sanctuary in the Plymouth area has those beautiful colors. So we're gonna switch a little bit to another thing which we often see in the fall, which is mushrooms. So this year, this summer, we haven't seen a lot of mushrooms. It wasn't a great year for the fruit of the mushroom. Fruit, what we most recognize as the mushrooms. So the underneath the ground, what we can't see is the mycelium. And the hyphae is actually a part of the mycelium. It's thin threads. The mycelium is certainly a living part of the mushroom. It is one of the largest organisms, um, organs, I should say, in of, of all living things. It spreads its stuff out. And its basically job is to, to help the mushroom grow and also to help to de decompose things. So the mushrooms are one of the cleanup crews of the natural world. So all those leaves that fall down to the ground, all those, anything that, that dies, just like in your compost pile, things get decomposed and the mycelium of the mushroom is responsible for that. So a really, really important job. When the conditions are right, when, the when it's moist weather and there's been a lot of rain, then the mycelium sends a signal for the fruiting bodies of the mushroom, the parts that we're familiar with to come out and grow. And we can see as you can, a huge variety of the mushrooms over here. So we can see the coral fungus in the upper left over there, down below on the left, that's one called chicken of the woods, which is considered a prime edible. Then the middle is a type of what's called turkey tail. So plant, lots of different types of mushrooms. The upper right, a type of amanita, um, several, several mushrooms. The mushrooms serve at another major role in that they have what's called a mycorrhizal relationship with many plants. In fact, I was reading that I think it's about 80% of plants actually have some sort of a relationship with mushrooms. So that is an awful lot. Some of them have a relationship so that it actually, one will help the other, but the plant can certainly do fine without the mushroom, the mushroom may enhance it, but it can um, basically provide for nutrients. Uh, other plants like the lady slipper is requires a mycorrhizal relationship, meaning 
the lady slipper has, the roots of the lady slipper have to grow in association with the roots or the mycorrhizae of the mushroom. So many people may have heard years ago, or maybe even now, don't pick um, lady slippers, they won't grow. And the truth is, is that they won't grow unless you get that mushroom or that mycorrhizae, the roots with it, and then the lady slipper will grow. So we're gonna switch to another thing which is happening in the fall, and that's seed dispersal. So the seeds of plants, their job is to spread themselves out so they're, they're not growing in the shade of their parent tree. So it's kind of like the kids who just have to leave home and find a place of their own. So if you wanna put in the chat, some of the different mechanism ways that seeds disperse. And then Robert, if you can just read a few, that'd be great. All right, Patty, let's see. Birds, 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 water. Anyone else have any answers? Uh, wind and birds, wind, wind. <laughs> okay. Everybody is right. So we have wind, our very first one. So, and we'll get to, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about each of these in a minute and show you some examples. Gravity. So some of them just fall to the ground with gravity. Water, somebody mentioned water. Force, this is a really fun one. I'll show you an example of that in a minute and animals. So all those who said birds, yes, birds and animals. So the wind, I think we're all familiar with dandelions, blowing the dandelion seeds, and that is doing the dandelions a great service by spreading out the seeds. The maple, the little, the seeds of the maple. When I was a kid, we would put them on our nose and then we would watch as they fall and we'd call it like a helicopter down as they twirl around. So having that little helicopter, that little on the seed, and then something to propel it like a helicopter, twirl it around means that it's spreading out. And milkweed, so milkweed blowing in the wind. Milkweed is a great um, plant um, for and basically required in the monarch butterfly's life cycle. Gravity, so this is a beach seed, so it falls to the ground and then rolls. Acorns also fall to the ground by gravity and roll. Robert said that somebody mentioned water, which is great. In all my times of doing this program, I don't think anybody mentioned water. So good for the people who did. So water will, or um, something like cranberries, will be found in the water and then the force of the water will move them around. And then for, or um, spring loaded or force or mechanical dispersion. So this plant is called witch hazel. Witch hazel is an amazing small tree shrub that does grow, na it's a native plant in New England and it actually is the last plant to flower. So we see those little yellow flowers over there that you can see well into November. But the seeds of the witch hazel basically will burst open. So they're like spring loaded and they'll burst open and they will then travel. It's like a spring, which sends them, it can be up to 30 feet. And it's pretty forceful as well. I haven't experienced this myself, but I have read that people standing by a witch hazel, when it disperses, can actually get hit by one and it can actually hurt. But beautiful, beautiful plant, the witch hazel. People used to also, in fact, they still do. Some folks believe that if you take the branch of a witch hazel, then it will and if you're looking to, for well water, so a place to put your well to dig, 
um, the witch hazel branch will bend. So that's dowsing. And a lot of people, a lot of farmers still believe in that. So somebody mentioned about birds carrying seeds. And certainly this blue jay is giving us an example of taking this acorn and bringing it someplace else. So fall is a time when some of our birds leave and some of our birds stay. And some birds come down here from the north to spend the winters. So on the top, we have the Baltimore Oriole. So it's all about, can they find food and protection? So since the Baltimore Oriole is more of a fruit eater and specific fruits, they do migrate. The hummingbird is not gonna find nectar in the winter, so they migrate. Then we get to the birds down below. So the black-capped chickadee is our state bird in Massachusetts. The black-capped chickadee is one that is around in the winter. The cedar waxwing um, is a fruit eater. So they are, they can basically have any fruit. So they are around, you'll see them in flocks. Um, it's almost like a kind of mini migrant where they might be in one area um, eating uh, berries. You might not see it in your yard for another few weeks until maybe there's a different berry source that they're looking for. And then the male cardinal over there, they're a seed eater. Cardinals actually were not year round residents in Massachusetts until maybe about 30, 40 years ago. And part of the reason why they are a year round resident is that New England is the bird feeding capital of the country. So by people feeding birds in the winter, that's actually kept the cardinals here. That's one theory. There's a lot of bird species that are also moving their range north for the winter or north year round, I should say. So the Carolina Wren, the Tufted Titmouse and the Cardinal are all examples of birds which have been moving north. And the red-bellied woodpecker, I bet a lot of people have seen that bird around in recent years, once considered a Southern species. So in the fall, we're gonna to change to mammals. Again, just like we talked about with the birds, it's all about preparing for winter. So what we see them doing in the fall is what they're doing to get ready for winter. So it's a challenge, finding enough food, finding shelter. So how do they meet this need? Some will migrate, some, but not that many, will hibernate. Some are sleepers or dormant. Some that we often think of as hibernate are actually sleepers and some are active. So I just mentioned it's all about food. So a major food source, a major plant food source is what we call mast. So there's soft mast, which are berries, such as this high bush cranberry, and hard mast, which is usually in the form of nuts. So acorns, beech nuts, hickory nuts. And this is a real important food source for most of our mammals unless they're not plant eaters. The carnivore certainly does not, does not make a difference with that. So with the mast crops over here, the oaks are a huge source of food. So it's thought that 25 to 50% of the fall diet of raccoons, deer, gray squirrel, mice, turkey, blue jays are acorns from oaks. So they are a very, very beneficial tree. And in fact, whoops, um, we can see in this picture, we will in a minute, that squirrels absolutely love the acorns. But we can see the top left, we can see the oaks, the leaves are pointed. That's the red oak family. And then the ones that have the rounded leaves, those are the white oak family. So they're chemically a little bit different. The white oaks have less tannins, they're less bitter than the red oaks. So uh, a lot of white oaks are more preferable, but these animals in the fall will be eating and gathering all sorts of acorns. 
oaks are also home to over 300 caterpillar species. And that supplies, those caterpillars during the, the nesting season supply lots of food to birds. The chickadee, I can't remember the exact figure, but they need so many caterpillars to survive. And again, found on the oak trees. Oaks also sequester more carbon than any of our the native trees. So really, really good tree to plant. There's our squirrels. Other mast, we can see, <clears throat> excuse me, um, pine cones and the pine cone to the, we could see it to the left and on the right, each of those things, those parts is called a scale. Each scale is home to two seeds. So that means that there's a lot of seeds, a lot of food for things like squirrels and chipmunks and turkeys. Uh, mushrooms are food to many animals as well. So our most visible mammal in the forest in the fall is the squirrel. Is the, we have the gray squirrel over here. And as I mentioned, they are so dependent on the mast crop. So in the late 1800s, we didn't have many acorns. The trees, they do what's called, uh, uh, they'll have certain years where we call, where they'll have produce all sorts of acorns. So they'll produce, and it's usually every two or three years. And in some years, if it's not what's called a mast crop, meaning there's very few acorns, the squirrels have been known to actually migrate. In the late 1800s, it was documented that they were actually swimming across the Connecticut River to get to the other side in search of food. So really, really dependent on um, acorns. In Massachusetts and New England, our native squirrel species are the gray squirrel, which we're all familiar with, the smaller red squirrel. The red squirrel is found more in conifer woods gathering food. And then there is the black squirrel. So the black squirrel, kind of interesting story. It's the same species as the gray squirrel. It's what's called melanistic, meaning extra pigmentation. And they were not native to Massachusetts, but in the late 1800s, there was a gentleman from a place called Stanley Park in Westfield, and he was from Michigan. And at the time it was legal to take some of those black squirrels from Michigan, bring them here. He felt much more at home with his native black squirrels. And they stayed in Westfield for several years and now we're really seeing them spread out throughout um, Massachusetts and into and certainly other parts of New England. So in the fall, watch for those squirrels communicating with their tails. Listen to the clucks and the squeals of the squirrels. It's all communication. And those harsh high-pitched calls, those are often territorial or warning of predators. Chipmunks, probably second most active mammal that we'll be seeing. They have little pouches in their cheeks made for storing food. A chipmunk, a little chipmunk can hold six acorns in those pouches and they will often bring them into their hole where they spend the winter. And you can see those little very circular holes about maybe three inches in diameter, goes straight down several feet, then spreads out into this whole network, which is where the chipmunk lives. So they, um, in the winter time, they're one of these sleepers, not a true hibernator. To be a true hibernator, your body temperature has to go way down. But a chipmunk's uh, a heartbeat will be less, metabolism less, and they'll live off of the stored food, which they have. There's a bunch of food probably left over from possibly a chipmunk. So a midden is a place where an animal stores some of this, the food, the debris, I should say. So they're peeling some of the, this looks like actually um, spruce seeds. 
So they're peeling these and leaving them over here in a pile. So this is a little mystery midden. So there is a mammal, which is very common in Massachusetts. And it likes to, it's great at climbing trees. And it lives more in the evergreen in pine or spruce forests, a little bit smaller than a gray squirrel. And it will leave behind these huge middens. It will take some of the seeds and it will leave them there. So it will bury them amongst the, the debris so that in the winter time, when it's looking for food, this whole litter pile helps to keep the food in, in good condition. All that debris on top helps preserve it. So if you wanna put in the chat what mammal you think left this midden, you can do so. Any answers, Robert? Uh, so far, we have a vole, uh, a red squirrel. Anyone else want to take a shot at it? Yeah. The red squirrel is it. Oh, there so, you go. Yeah. So the voles are underground, but if you see something like this, evidence of a red squirrel. And then you can see a lot the red squirrels, the chipmunks, the uh, the gray squirrels, I'm sorry, usually would be on top of uh, a stump like this. And this is where they would be leaving their debris. The gray squirrels will bury their seeds for the winter time. So they'll bury them one at a time, as opposed to that big pile of the gray squirrel. And it's said that a gray squirrel can smell through two feet of snow to find their seeds. And we saw the picture of the blue jay earlier taking some nuts or an acorn. Blue jays will cache or hide some nuts for later use. However, they often forget where they put them. Despite being a member of the smartest bird family, they often will forget where they put them. Whereas the gray squirrels usually recover about 80% of theirs. So we mentioned that there are a few mammals that are true hibernators. So a true hibernator, again, body temperature goes way, 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 way down. The woodchuck, also called the groundhog, their body temperature in the summer, it's 96.8. In the winter, 37.5. So they cannot get up and move. They are a true hibernator. In the fall, we can see them running around trying to get very, very uh, lots of food so that they can get a good fat layer because they have to live off that fat, fat layer. They're not getting up and eating as the red squirrel, the chipmunks, et cetera, are. Uh, two other mammals are true, true hibernators, meaning body temperature goes way down. So in our area, the meadow jumping mouse and the little brown bat. So those are the three, little meadow jumping mouse, little brown bat, and woodchuck. Which brings us to, what about the black bear? So it's not an actual true hibernator. Its body temperature drops, but just a few degrees. So it's, it, they're, they're in their dens. And if it's a warm day, they might be out looking for food. Um, it's, you're a female bear, you may give birth in the winter. So any moms out there probably know that it would be pretty hard to hibernate and give birth. So the bears can be active on warm days. Their numbers are increasing in Massachusetts. It used to be uh, that just that where, where I am in the Connecticut River Valley and West is where we had bears. But I bet those folks in Tewksbury, down, I think I heard somebody in Westwood, uh, somebody I think in New Hampshire, but um, certainly they are over the state now. I don't think they've made it to Cape Cod, but they are all, they're, they're spreading their population. Okay, the skunks uh, will be dormant, but they will be coming out looking for food as well in the winter time. 
the deer, very active in the winter. So in the fall, they grow a thicker coat. So the deer population is also doing really well, um, highest that we've ever had it. And it, to the point where they, they can definitely be a nuisance and also they're a host species for the deer tick. So um, deer population certainly does need to be monitored in the future. But in the fall, uh, they are definitely active. And again, one thing to look for is they get a thicker coat. So you can see that thicker kind of darker coat. Same thing with the coyote. And we're gonna end with just a few things that you can do in the fall. So please look and listen for things that are around you. So we talked a lot about looking. Listen, there's still insects that are calling out there right now. Observe seasonal phenomena, so many things that are related to fall. We at Mass Audubon have lots of resources. Get on our website if you'd like some of them or send me an email. Some of the uh, seasonal things, we can certainly see the milkweed, uh, I'm sorry, Joe Pie weed over there. Um, it's harvest time with all of those nuts. The woolly bear caterpillar over here that you can see on the right. Uh, which turns into what's called the Isabella moth down below and the milkweed. I mentioned lots of resources. Um, we ask that you do just be gentle and enjoy, have good ethics when you're observing the natural world. And just be sure to, uh, if you have pets and birds outside, just uh, a good thing to do, keeping cats indoors. Uh, and finally, just to mention that November is a time when there are a lot of ticks. So I know in our area, we hardly saw them in the, in the summertime, probably because of the drought. But in November, there's often two life stages. So don't let down your guard, do your tick checks. Poison ivy, you can get it at any time of year. So, and, and poison ivy, I should say, is absolutely gorgeous in the fall, that beautiful red color, but just be aware that you certainly can get it. So with that, this is what we talked about. And I'm sorry, I may have gone on a little too long, but um, I am gonna stop my um, screen sharing. And if anybody has any questions, I will be glad to answer them. So Patty, a wonderful job as expected. Um, and uh, we do have some questions in the chat, which I'll uh, get to here. Uh, Eva asks, Eva Jane asks, what happens to rabbits in the winter? Okay, so good question. They are active. So they're definitely active. They have a thick coat and we have two types. We've got the Eastern and the New England cotton tail. They almost look exactly the same, but they have dens where they'll go in for warmth. And they, just like your dog or cat, have that nice fur, often grow extra thick fur, like we were talking about the coyote and the deer, um, but definitely active in the winter time. Uh, Brett asks, am I correct to observe that in Florida and other Southern states, squirrels still hide food for winter? Are squirrels wired to hide food in winter, even if they are not hibernating? Uh, good question. And I'm not sure I could answer that in Florida, but what I probably would suspect is that they're caching so that they just are saving a supply. So they're not doing it for a whole season, like the chipmunks and the squirrels around here would. And I should just add to that, that our chipmunks and squirrels would go out looking for more. And the gray squirrel, we can see it, it is more active in the winter than the red and the chipmunk, which are more uh, in their den more. But I would probably say that it's taking it, it may be just getting a good food supply just so that they can have it, but it's probably not a huge source. So that's as best as I can answer that. Let's see, Mary asks, what do you suggest to be safe from deer ticks and Lyme disease? 
So excellent question. I would suggest uh, doing your tick checks. So uh, uh, wearing pants that you can put your socks over your pants and wearing light colored pants. Uh, we often at Mass Audubon, uh, the staff will have our pants sprayed with permethrin, which I'm not a, usually an advocate of pesticides, but in this case, I think it's a really good thing. I think the benefits certainly outweigh the risk. It's not directly on our skin, but it's on our clothes and it's something that really does repel the ticks. So I would definitely do that. Uh, you can get tick gaiters. So it's like, just like if you're familiar with the gaiters, just something that you put on like your, from your ink, your heel of your foot to your knee, you can get the same thing. They usually Velcro now and they can catch ticks on them. And so those are what I would really recommend, but most important, make sure to do a tick check um, each day. Um, I've gotten in the habit of carrying around with me scotch tape so that if I find a tick, I pretty much laminate it. It's an easy way just to get it, just to put the tick sticky part on it and then just fold it over. Let's see here. Margaret asks, how common are butternut trees in Eastern Mass? The gray squirrels love those nuts. Yes, they do. Unfortunately, um, butternuts are on the decline. So there's a lot of forest pathogens that are specific to many trees. You're probably familiar with the hemlock woolly, woolly adelgid, the ash um, insect, ash borer, um, Asian longhorn beetle, and the butternuts have had something as well. So not that many native butternuts, a lot have been planted. There's something very closely related called the bitternut hickory that um, looks very similar. Um, butternut is also in the walnut family. So there are walnuts as well, um, but unfortunately not too many butternuts around. Uh, Elizabeth asks, what is the status of the avian flu should we start feeding birds once the colder weather sets in? My understanding, and I think that it's, it's kind of a work in progress and kind of learning about this. So my understanding is that it's fine to feed birds at, once the cold weather sets in and that the avian flu is not a big problem now with our wild population of birds. And, and, and that it had been, there was a lot of talk that it was also related to the locust, um, was it two years ago, I think, was it last year or two years ago, when it was that, I think it was the seven year locust in the, that was south of Massachusetts. And the avian flu seemed to be in, very much related to the zone where the locusts were and the timing. So as I said, my understanding now is that we don't need to worry about it. Um, if it does become a problem, then um, I, I think it, it's something that we'll, certainly will be notified about in the news and bring those bird feeders in. Um, also watch, I think more to be concerned with is sometimes we get with the goldfinches, it's a type of conjunctivitis. So just kind of be aware of that in your area as well. Uh, Mariette asks, where do bumblebees go? Uh, good, good question. So some bumblebees will go in the, in the ground. So some of the population will actually die. Some of them will go in the ground and they'll hibernate there as adults. And final question goes to Teresa. Do birds, squirrels, chipmunks, and other small animals carry ticks? Uh, some certainly can. So some of them, just like our dogs and cats, can carry them on them. Uh, 
some are specific. There's a, a tick um, that's very specific to moose and the deer can get it, but it's more, it's called a winter tick when that doesn't affect humans, but it's really affected the moose population in the north. Um, some birds will actually eat ticks and it doesn't seem to affect them. Um, I should say birds, some mammals a lot will. And ticks are for some, depending on what the tick is. And as I mentioned, like with the deer, they're a part of the cycle of the deer tick. So they definitely do have, do carry ticks. So I hope that answers that question. And Patty, we started a few minutes late and we're gonna end a few minutes late here. It's 12.04, so we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, I wanna thank uh, everyone uh, for, uh, 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 I guess, watching us uh, this, uh, this morning. I wanna thank the friends of the Tewksbury Library along with the libraries in Andover and Danvers for helping uh, Tewksbury with this event. And uh, I want uh, to remind folks to look for their email uh, tomorrow uh, from me with a feedback survey, a link to this recording, and information about three more upcoming virtual programs we have scheduled with Mass Audubon. Patty, do you have any last words before we uh, end the session? No, just thank you to everybody who joined us. Thank you to the Tewksbury Library. And everybody, it's a beautiful day. Get out, enjoy fall. And if there's anything that I didn't answer, um, please feel free to send me an email. Robert can just pass that information on to you. Sure. Great. Thank you so much, Patty. Thank you all. Everyone enjoy the rest of their day. Enjoy this beautiful day. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Yep.